Um, so, uh, one thing, um, if, if you've come here to listen to what the genomic revolution is going to do to you in terms of personalised healthcare, then it's unfortunately the wrong seminar. Uh, the, the role of computer science and mathematics in that space has been enormous, but I'm, I'm not really qualified to talk about that. Uh, what I think I am qualified to talk about is, uh, is the role modelling and simulation is played in, in cardiac electrophysiology. And that's what I'll talk about today. So the overview of, of my presentation is, is as follows. I'll, I'll say a, a few things about the heart. And then the, the focus will be on variability and heterogeneity at different levels associated with electrophysiology. From iron channels through to tissue, through to variability between, so people to people variability. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the experimental and clinical data that we have access to. And then how you go about building mathematical models and simulations and how you validate those models against, uh, against the data we have. And then I want to s introduce uh, a little bit of new science which is the development of a, of a spatial bi biomarker for electrophysiology. And then some, some conclusions, future environments, models and, and some ethics. Okay, so some issues in cardiac electrophysiology. So cardi cardiac arrhythmia, it's an abnormal electrical activity in the heart. Uh, in ventricular fibrillation, the electrical wave that propagates in a smooth way through the heart and which is responsible for the heart to contract, to beat and to pump blood, uh, that those electrical waves break up and this, become, this can become life-threatening. Sudden cardiac death kills 5 to 10 people per year per 10,000 population in the West and about half of that uh, is attributable to ventricular arrhythmias. So there's various treatments that, that, that can take place. Uh, you can, patients can have defibrillators implanted. They're, they're very effective, very robust technology, but of course they're invasive. Uh, patients exhibiting a recurrent non phasal arrhythmia can be treated through ablation. So essentially you use radio frequency waves to burn chunks of cardiac tissue to try and control the wave breakup, to try and control the irregular propagation of this electrical wave. Uh, it's a very imprecise art. And often what happens, I hope there's not too many versions here, uh, a lot of tissue gets burnt in order to, it's a sort of overkill in some sense. And then the goal of drug therapy is to prevent arrhythmia. But nearly every antiarrhythmic drug has the potential to be pro-arrhythmic. Uh, not across whole populations, but possibly across subsets of populations. So these are some of the issues. And the question is, well, can modelling and simulation play any sort of role in, in this space? So these are some of my, my scientific heroes. I hope you admire uh, this gentleman in the middle. Uh, that's Toffee, that's our dog, uh, wearing a very smart knitted uh, pullover by, by Pamela. Uh, he's looking very elegant there, and there's a reason he's there. Uh, these other five, anyone recognise some of these people? Sure, yep. Any others? <laughs> No, it's not. No, that's a good guess, actually. That's, that's a good guess. That's Andrew Huxley. That's Alan Hodgkin. That's Dorothy Hodgkin. And that's Lewis Fry Richardson. So, by any, any understanding, when people ask, what has mathematics done in the area of biology and physiology, we cite these two gentlemen, Hodgkin and Huxley. So they did fundamental work 
in understanding the propagation of electrical waves uh, in, in neuron tissue uh, by understanding how ion channels open and close and how this wave propagates through, through, through fibres. And they received, they started this work in 36 and they got the Nobel Prize for that work in 63. And it's one of the few, few cases where you, you can answer the question, what has math, mathematics done in biology and physiology? What is, has it led to something? Usually maths is reactive. Some experiments are done, you build a model, and it, 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 it can tell you what you see, but it can't necessarily predict something. Um, but their work was, was truly predictive and opened up a whole field of mathematical physiology. Uh, Lewis Fry Richardson is a bit orthogonal, but um, uh, he was a meteorologist um, um, and he did some very interesting work. He was a forerunner of supercomputing in some sense, and I'll talk a bit about that later. And this wonderful woman is Dorothy Hodgkin, who uh, she got the Nobel Prize in 1964, the year after Hodgkin and Huxley. And she's famous for her work on X-ray crystallography. And about 10 years ago, I can't, I can't remember the name of the person who got, uh, who got the Nobel Prize, but it was using her techniques in understanding structures of ion channels. So these, these are some of the, my, my scientific heroes, I guess. All right, so variability in heterogeneity in the heart. What are some of the issues? So there's inter-individual variability. This variability uh, is an issue because what people do is from experimental data they extract certain biomarkers. So these biomarkers may be indicators of, of potential arrhythmia, there may be biomarkers that help in, in the developments of dr drugs and so on. And so the issue is, as we'll see in a minute, that there is incredible variability between all of us. If we're all sitting here, uh, hearts beating away, listening to the seminar. So how do you deal with that? So this is fundamental to personalised medicine. We, we need to understand this variability. It's also true that some drug development has been had to stop at a very late stage of development, costing the companies hundreds of millions of dollars, due to that the drug induced arrhythmia in a subset of the population. So variability in these biomarkers is a major challenge for risk stratification. It occurs at many, many scales. At ion channel dynamics, uh, the intercell differences in ion channel expression, structural differences of the heart, uh, between people in age, sex, race, and even time of day. So you have this massive variability. How do you deal with it? How do you understand it? So, a partial hypothesis is that improved understanding of the causes and consequences of variability can lead to improved targeting of pharmaceutical interventions and improved clinical outcomes. So, I just want to go a go few, three examples of, of the way variability can arise. So, this is called beat-to-beat -beat variability. So, this is a typical action potential that propagates from cell to cell in cardiac tissue. So you, this is an action potential, it's an electrical wave, this propagates from cell to cell, myocyte cells are connected by gap junctions and these waves propagate through the gap junctions along fibres, and fibres are collections of cells arranged in a linear, linear direction. So the same cell recorded over time and you, know, you see some reasonable variability here. Yet most models don't capture this variability, they, they, they give you a single, a single trace. So a, a deterministic model would give you a single trace, the next beat would be exactly the same, the next beat would be exactly the same and so on. So there's no variability in there. So how might you capture that? So one way to capture that variability from a mathematical modelling sense is to develop a mathematical model. A mathematical model 
has associated with it usually a set of parameters. And usually that model has a single set of parameters with, with, with certain values. So a new idea is to build populations of models where you have a mathematical model, but along with that mathematical model is you have sets of parameters that all fit to the experimental data in that way. And you might have a hundred different sets of parameters. Each of those different sets of parameters, in conjunction with the model, satisfies the experimental biomarkers. And then you can use that population of models to do to understand better the inherent variability in, in, the, in the system. And it's, it's not just applied to cardiac electrophysiology, it's a new development in, in modeling. The second way that heterogeneity arises in cardiac tissue is that if you look, a pic, uh, look at a piece of cardiac tissue, it consists of cardiac myocytes. So these myocytes are arranged in long chains with a certain thickness and they, they spiral around the, the myocardium. But between these myocytes, there are blood vessels, connective tissue, other cell types, fibroblasts, all sorts of things, collagen, fat, empty space. So the heart is a complex, heterogeneous mixture of all sorts of different things. And so there is spatial heterogeneity. So how do you understand that spatial heterogeneity? Given a, a certain structure, why does that heart behave in that, some, in, in that way as opposed to a different way for another structure? And then there's intersubject anatomical variability. So this is some, some data from Ralph Bordas, who's a, was a student of Blanca Rodriguez in Oxford. Um, so in the ventricular cavity, there are Purkinje fibers that hang in the, in, in, the, in the cavity, and they attach into the walls of the ventricular tissue. And so this was data from, from four rats, uh, and reconstructed reconstructed the hanging fiber network in each rat. Each rat was more or less, well I, think, well, I know each rat was of the same sex and more or less the same age. Yet what you see here is incredible variability in this, uh, in this Purkinje network. But the hearts of the four rats, when they were alive, all behaved in more or less the same way. So how do you understand that, that difference? And so if you talk about pers personalised medicine, then you need to understand that. And here's a, a couple of slides which I, which I got from Hugh Watkins, who runs the Cardiovascular Centre also at Oxford. And uh, this is normal myocardial tissue, so you see that, that they, the myocytes line, line up along these lines and in sheets. And this stuff is the sort of um, the space between the sheets. But in certain diseased conditions, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, you get myocyte disarray, and so you lose this nice structure and you, and you get this sort of structure. And so then the question is, what is the effect of the structure on the propagation of the electrical waves through the heart? They don't know the answer to that, and the question is, can modelling play a role in trying to elucidate those answers? So here's, here's the hypothesis, it's fairly obvious, but computational modelling offers sample specific or patient specific understanding of potential arrhythmogenic consequences of variability. So it enables us, us to elucidate the effects of variability at the ion channel level, at the tissue level, at, at the heart level. In order to do, so this is a reasonable hypothesis, in order to do this new modelling approaches are needed to capture this variability. One approach is this population of models. So what you see here, imagine you have some mathematical model, and that cross represents one set of parameters. So normally a model would be uh, a mathematical formulation with a set of parameters having specific values. In a population of models, here we have 
four different sets of parameters, all of which fit the experimental data, fit the, the biomarker data that we have. And so now we, can, we have a population of models that we can explore variability and the effects of variability. A second approach that's um, being used more and more are the use of phenomenological models. So what's a, what's a phenomenological model? It's a model that doesn't try to rep reproduce biophysically detailed phenomena if you don't have that data. So if you measure certain things, then there's no reason why a model should try and model things that are not there in your data. So that's a, a phenomen phenomenological approach. A question might be, well, if uh, you're going to have some sur surgery or some, some intervention and we've been used, using mathematical models to make some predictions and I tell you, well, oh, we've used a phenomenological model and not a biophysically, what, what might you think? I don't know what I might think. And perhaps it's related to this, this point here. Okay. So, what's the, what sorts of data do we have? So, there's, there's many sorts. So, the, perhaps the most common data that we can get is electrocardiograms. So, um, you can put little electrodes on, on, the, on the surface of the, of the body, or indeed, you can, if you've had some surgery, you can put them on, on the heart itself. And then, uh, you can measure an electromagnetic mag field, essentially. So when you do that, you get a typical, what's called a, a T wave. You get a, a typical wave that looks like this. And they measure, so this, this, this is a representation of the electrical activity of the heart. And, and what's happened is you often measure this interval between Q and T. So that, that, that's a biomarker. And there are different forms of this that biomarker, but it's essentially all of that variety. And that biomarker plays an enormously important role in the development of drugs. So if you have Pfizer and it's de they've developed a drug, and you put it, give the drug to your favorite dog uh, and see what happens, um, then if you get length and QT intervals, that's not a good biomarker. Drug, does, drug gets removed from development. So, since 2005, regulators, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies and regulators like this, uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration in the States, have required that all, nearly all drugs are evaluated in this thorough QT study. But there's an inherent variability in these QT biomarkers both in the same patient over time and between patients with the same genetic mutations. So, and uh, the regulators have acknowledged this is an issue and they're developing new ways of, new approaches to can overcome some of the drawbacks associated with variability. And one of these new ways is, is to use models. But that's only just come about very, very recently. Other types of measurements, you can do isolated cell patch clamp. So you have a single cell, you have a, a, a glass pipette, and you can inject a current, well there's an electrode inside the glass pipette, so you can inject the current into the cell through the membrane of the cell. And you can measure this action potential within the cell. This, this, this typical action potential. And this, this action potential, as we'll see in a minute, comes about through various ion channels opening and closing. So you can measure this action potential. You can also get drugs that block certain types of ion channels. And then you can measure the, the current of a particular ion channel, like this. So you get information about the behavior of a single myocyte in this way. You can do optical mapping of the heart. So you can inject fluorescent dyes into a, into a heart. These dyes fluoresce um, 
and, uh, and they change with the membrane potential of the cell and then you can measure, you can measure the, the, the signal is recorded using a camera and you can measure what's happening uh, as the wave propagates through the heart. You can also, this is from a joint PhD student of ours at Oxford, and you can do histologies. So you can chop chop the heart up, section it, and look at look at look at slices. And again, this is a slice of a rat, and you can see you can see the, ven the ventricular tissue, and you can see how incredibly heterogeneous it is. <coughs> you can do in vivo experiments during operations. You can do in vitro experiments, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, where you actually have heart cells growing in a dish. Uh, and finally, diffusion tensor MRI. So diffusion tensor magnetic resonance imaging uh, is associated with the property water molecules diffuse in living tissues, and you can magnetise and demagnetise the protons in the water by applying a, a magnetic pulse. So the, 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 um, the spins of the protons flip and then they reorientate themselves back again. And you can use that to... Uh, here's, here's a sample of a particular image of, of a rat heart. Uh, you can use that to extract structural information about the heart. So we have all these different modalities, all these different data modalities. Um, there's issues in how you store that data, how you manipulate that data, you've got images, you've got all sorts of things. Even just curating and managing the data is, is an issue. Okay, how am I going? All right, okay. I'm, I'm a very poor timekeeper because I don't have a watch. Uh, all right, so build, building mathematical models and, and simulating them. So this is a, a typical a typical pipeline where you get you get data from various modalities. It might be single cell data, it might be data from um, optical mapping, uh, it might be data from other sources. One of the things that you have to do in order to build simulations of heart is you have to generate a mesh. So you have to generate a computational mesh from histology data, uh, optical mapping data, image data, histological data. So the fundamental, the most important thing that you did, so there's software that does this, uh, software like Tarantula, given, given image data, you can build a computational mesh in 3D that captures the structure of, of the heart. So you have a computational mesh so you can think of these as lots of little, lots of little pyramids in 3D that are all fitted together, all of different sizes. And what you have is you have a mathematical formalism across across the whole heart, and you decompose that mathematical formalism into equations on each of these little elements, and then you, and then you have to solve the propagation of the wave through these, however many computational elements you have through time. Uh, of course, once you've built it, so you need simulation software to do this. There are issues when you run the simulation software, it might not work, you might have to do something else. There's issues that with, well, you don't have all the parameters, so what do you do? You have to do some parameter es estimation. So there's this huge feedback loop that you have to deal with. And I haven't said anything there about building the mathematical models. And I'm going to now. Okay, so Hutchkin and Huxley um, uh, published uh, their cell model in 1952, looking at the pr propagation of action potentials in the in the in the giant axon of a squid. So it's not a giant squid; but it's the, it's the giant axon in the squid. And fundamentally, what they had to understand is the role of ion channels in, in in cells, and these cells are excitable cells. So, in its crudest form, an ion channel is just 
a collection of proteins embedded in the, in the membrane of the cell that can open and close. Open, ions let, let through in whichever direction, in or out of the cell, close, nothing happens. So understanding, it's important to understand the structure of these ion channels in order to build reliable models, but back in 1952, they didn't understand at all the structure of ion channels. Hodgkin and Huxley had no clue what sort of structures the ion channels. But they, they attempted to elucidate these structures from experimental observation and also some clever math mathematical modelling. <clears throat> and they focus essentially on only two types of ion channels, uh, sodium and potassium. Now, it was also a leaky, a leaky ion channel as well, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, now we know that there may be at least 20 different types of ion channels to open and close in different ways to have this ionic flux in and out of a, of a, of a, of a myocyte. But then they didn't know. But they postulated that a sodium channel consisted of a set of gates, an M gate, an H gate, and the potassium channel consisted of a set of N gates. And here there are three M gates and an H gate, and here there are four N gates. And all of those gates have to be open if an ion, ionic flux is to flow. So, I think that was um, the brief history of time. I had only one formula in it. I, I think I got three or four, so. Um, I, I, I sort of apologize, but I sort of don't. Uh, so the cell model is based on Ohm's law. So it relates the change in voltage to a current. There's two types of current. There's the stimulus current, so you need to set the thing off with some applied current. And there's the ionic current. And the ionic current is the sum of currents through the ion channels. Uh, in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, actually, there, there really wasn't any calcium. There were, there were two um, ion fluxes, sodium and potassium. So the I ion was the sum of sodium and potassium. And then the sodium current and the potassium current are related to uh, the voltage, the driving force for the voltage through a conductance. And this conductance is uh, proportional to the product associated with the different gates that make up that ion channel. So in, in the case of, of sodium, well I've got, got this J gate in there, you can forget about it. Uh, when the M gates and the A gates are all open, then there's a flow of ions. So then you need to understand these gates. So it's, it's just a gate, you go through a gate, it's a door, the door opens and closes. So you need to understand how that door open, opens and closes. So this is a, 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 a teeny weeny little model that says the proportion of uh, channels in the open state is some small, a little differential equation. So this is the change in cons, the change, if you like, think of it as the concentration of, of the, or the numbers of channels in the open state in any given time. So it says that this time varying quantity has this relationship. What the one minus x, the x is gates open, one minus x is gates closed. You can half believe this formula makes sense. Uh, and these alphas and betas are the, the rates at which the gates open and close. The complicated feature is that the, these alphas and betas depend on the voltage. The voltage depends on the current, the current depends on these things. So it's a highly coupled nonlinear system of equations that, that you need to solve. And when you solve them, you get this typical action potential shape that propagates from cell to cell along the fibres, that regular propagation causes the, um, the heart to contract and to beat in a regular way. And the reason is, is because at this point here, 
the, the calcium channel, which is not in, in the model, kicks in, and it's the, calci it's the ionic calcium fluxes that cause the myocyte heart to contract and expand, contract and expand. So the electrical wave, as it propagates from cell to cell through the, the calcium fluxes of the ion, the calcium ion fluxes, that causes the contraction of the heart, contract, expand, contract, expand, the heart beats in a coordinated, regular way. If the electrical wave is not propagating smoothly, you don't get the smooth contraction of the heart, and that's not particularly good. So, <clears throat> there's one up, two more equations. Okay, it's, it's getting a bit more formidable, but let me, let me talk you through it. So, this, this equation is called a, a partial differential equation. It's an equation here, so this is a derivative with respect to time. So, here, V is the voltage, and it's position of, a function of time and space. So, now we think of this electrical wave propagating through tissue. It's a, functional, it's a function of time and where it is in a tissue, function of space. So all this equation does is that the derivative with respect to time has some um, relationship over here. And this nabla here represents a derivative with respect to space. So it's an equation that relates flux and flows in time and in space. That's, that's, that's all you need to know. It's called a continuum equation. And that continuum equation is, is an equation for the whole of, of the whole heart, which you have to solve. This D is called a diffusion tensor. Here's the, the iron, iron current. The complicating feature, of course, so this is an equation for the propagation in tissue, but you have to have a cell model. You have to have a model that says what happens at the cellular level. So the Hodg Hodgkin-Huxley is, is an example of a cell model. That model has now been replaced. There are up to 100, 100 different types of cell models all doing different types of things. And so this differential equation, this partial equa differential equation is coupled to a cell model, which is an ordinary differential equation. And that's, that's the set of equations that you need to solve that will describe the propagation of an electrical wave in time and in space. And this is the, the typical action potential you get in a cell, and this is how it propagates through space. You see here is here's space now. Okay, so, I, I, so that's the sort of modeling framework. The modeling framework there, the important thing is building the cell model. Once you have a cell model, you can couple it into your, into your continuum model. Uh, I've more or less said this, so from various different data modalities, you build this computational mesh. You can think of this, comp you can, here's, here's a room, you divide this room up into little sub-regions, and each sub-region you, you're solving a little equation. Uh, these, not independently, because there's a propagation of an electrical current from element to element. That's what you want to solve. And Chaste is the public domain software that we've been developing at Oxford. They were developing it before I came. It's been, been developing for six or seven years. There's now 200,000 lines of code, and it runs on big supercomputers super and GPUs as well. <coughs> Which brings me to this slide. Um, I don't know, so you can read this, this is from Wikipedia, it's, it's a quote by Lewis Fry Richardson in 1922. So, have a bit of a read. A computer here is a person, it's a computer war, a person who computes. What is Richardson describing?
he's describing a, a big supercomputer. He's, he's describing a, a distributed supercomputer. So by that I mean a, a, a big box with computers, processors inside that box, or there may be many boxes, they're all connected by fast, by fast networks. Um, attached to that, there's a big data storage, and so on and so forth. So what Richardson, back in 1922, was describing a, a supercomputer. And he, had, and he actually got this to work. He actually had a room with people in it, and each person would compute their own, their own little part of the equation, and then would pass it on to the people next door. And you can pass it on in a synchronised, I can hold up my hand and say, you know, pass information left, left and right please. Or you can actually pass it synchronously. And actually, interestingly, you can, you can get the same answer, whether you synchronise it or whether you asynchronise it. You have to be a bit careful. So this was, uh, so this, you know, how has computing changed in the last 140 years? So this is Babbage's analytical engine, which is in, uh, uh, where is that, Science Museum in, in London. This is, this is Richardson's vi vision. This is ENIAC, uh, I think 1949, that, you know, you know, basically you could, could you know, multiply, multiply a few matrices together and not much else. This is GPUs, and this is, this is some, a large supercomputer, I think it was at Los Alamos, it was the third largest in the world a year or two ago. So that's where we've come, you know, in, in not such a long period of time, it's, it's amazing. And so now we, 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 we can run Chase, we can run our simulation package on, on, on things like this, not quite that big, and also on things like that. Okay, so the last bit of mathematics and, and the last part of the talk. So what, what this is about is towards the development of a, of a spatial cardiac electrophysiological biomarker. So it's work that we've actually submitted to Nature Communications and, and um, we've had two very good referees reports and one that says please do some more work. So it's, but we're, we're vaguely optimistic. So, what is this about? Well, what I've said is that the, the mathematical model that describes this propagation through tissue consists of a continuum equation. So this is an equation across tissue connected to an ordering differential equation, which is the cell model. It's the model that describes the ionic fluxes in and out of the cell, which then informs the action potential, which I've called V, and the action potential propagates through tissue. So the, the, these two things are connected through this, this high iron. This, this is sometimes called the cable equation or sometimes called the diffusion equation. It gets a little technical, so I, I, I don't want to say too much, but this, this nabla nabla, this operator, is, is, is called a Laplacian. And it's an example of what's called a local operator. So it's an operator that really describes diffusion in a small neighbourhood of, of a certain point. All we've done, and all we've done is replaced the Laplacian, which is nabla nabla, by some other power. So rather than Laplacian, rather than there being a power two, we've replaced that power by a fractional power. That's all we've done. And you might think, well, there's some, like, what's, what's, that's not particularly exciting. What does that do? Does that do anything interesting? So what it does, as soon as alpha is not two, it turns a local model into a non-local model. And this non-local model has the effect of trying to capture the spatial heterogeneity that I've, I've described. And, and it can do it rather well. And so I can't really go into any more details on that, so that's the point of the model. It turns a non-local model, oh, sorry, it doesn't do that, it turns a local model into a non-local model. The cell model is still the same. Right, so some validation. So why, why do we want to do that? What we want to do is to use this alpha here 
as a spatial biomarker. We want to be able to say that in certain, con in cer certain conditions, this alpha should be in this range. In other pathological states, alpha should be in this range. In this particular case, alpha should be in this range. So we want to use it as a spatial biomarker. And if you can do that in a meaningful way, that actually has profound significance into all sorts of things in terms of drug development, because drug development is based on single cell measurement. It's very rarely based on, on tissue. I mean, it is, of course, but it's mainly based at the single cell level. So it can have profound consequences if it works. So we tried to do some validation. So this is a wonderful piece of work um, by a group in the States where they plate up neonatal <coughs> cell, cardiac cell cultures in a dish. Right? So you're growing a, a monolayer of cells, of, of rat heart cells in a dish. So they plate them up and they let them grow. And you can't see that the shape very well, but here's the dish and here's, here, here are the, um, the cells. And you can control the way these cells line up. They can learn, line up in certain structures or they can line up in a random way, so you can control how they get plated into the dish. And it's an in silico representation of, of, the, of the cardiac fibers. And so all we did um, is we did, some, we did some simulations. So, uh, okay, so the interesting thing is that uh, under the, so here's the dish. You stimulate the cells at the center of the dish and you record the propagation of this electrical signal through the dish. And what you see here is that um, in the center, of, near the center, you get this action potential that looks like this. And near the boundary, you get a, much, you get a shortening of the action potential. And that's known to happen in, in, in vivo. That, that's called action potential shortening. So it's known to happen. And then we took various traditional models and we, um, we just ran them. And we found it very hard to match this experimental data with traditional values where this alpha was 2, so standard diffusion. But when we, when we built our, um, our non-local model, and we had to do something, we had to modify the cell model very slightly, but it was kosher. Uh, you could see a very good matching between that and the experimental data. And so does that tell us that you know, everything is a non-local model? No, but it tells us that traditional models in some settings can't capture the experimental data very well, and this new model could. That's about all that tells you. Okay, so then we went away and we, we got access to some, some collaborators in London, some experimental data in human, dog, and, and, and rabbit. And basically measured the action potential duration, so you get the signal that goes up and comes down. The, the period in which it takes to come back down to repolarize is called the APD, action potential duration. And that was measured, oops, as a function of the activation time. So it's, in fact, it's propagating through tissue. So this is experimental data and we see these things. And over here is the, running the model. And um, let me see now if I can remember what, what this was. Oh yes, so the red, the red line, corresponded to the traditional localized model and the green and the blue corresponded to a non-local model with different values of alpha and the dashed and the full line just represented the, the length of the domain that we were running this in. So again, if you're looking at this, so one of the things that the standard models do is they plateau. So this is the standard model, it pla it's plateauing here. That's not what happens. This is, this is known, but people have ignored it. They just said, oh, well, I don't know. There are other biomarkers that, that, that work okay. But th this, is, this is actually quite important. The standard model's plateau. The non-local model is not plateauing. So you can half believe that's, it's not a validation again, but it's some sort of corroboration. 
Finally, and then I've got three slides left, if you bear with me. This is data that we got, that we uh, worked on only in the last three weeks about Alfonso uh, Bueno Rodia in Oxford. It's DT MRI data of a rat. And essentially you get these slices of images and what, what we've done is try to do two things. So for each, for each slice we construct a diffusion tensor. So T is, uh, no, L is longitudinal, so that's, that's in the direction of the fibre and T and N are transverse and normal to the fibre. So you have three directions. So each point in the cardiac tissue you have a diffusion tensor that points along the fibre transversely and normal to the fibre. So that's what that thing is. And these Bs, these betas are actually the alphas. So they're the index in this non-local model. And what you see is that normal and transversal, the colours here are more or less about one. Okay, so things are behaving sort of lo locally. But along the fibre, these, the value is, so think of one being two now, I've, normally, I've divided by two. Uh, the values are about 0 0.7 or 0.8. So again, that seems to be a not unreasonable validation of our, of our, of our new model. And so remember that we want to use this index as a biomarker, as a spatial biomarker. Okay, so just two slides. <clears throat> so, some, some sort of point, some issues about modelling. So when, when you do mathematical modelling, you, you, you don't do it in a vacuum. You do it in response to a set of questions and, and the data that you have access to. In Oxford, and not just in Oxford, we're building more and more complicated models, models that have 20 million elements in the computational mesh that run on big, big supercomputers that have all sorts of complexity. Should we just keep on adding complexity to the model? Well, one answer is yes. The second answer is how do you validate a model with increasing complexity? Then you can ask, should a model be intuitive? I've struggled a little bit to describe my non-local model to you in an intuitive way, and that's my fault, not yours. Um, but it's a reason that you probably go away from thinking, I don't really understand what this non-local model is. It's not intuitive. The use of phenomenological models versus biophysically detailed models. If we're talking about modelling having a role in the clinic, and you know, well, okay, I've used this biophysical model or this phenomenological model, and you don't understand modelling particularly well, you might have a view on that. Mm, I don't want this phenomenological model anywhere near me. So there are issues there. Now, and this is very important. Cardiac models often use simplified geometries. Patient-specific models are based on clinical images of limited resolution. The extent to which these simplifications affect simulation results remain largely unexplored. So that tells us something about you know, patient-specific modelling and patient-specific healthcare. And, well, that's just me being interested in that, the work that we're doing. And finally, the last slide. So this is where Toffee comes back in. And this is the... As, as uh, someone trained in mathematics, I, I struggle to deal with that, that. So this is from, this is a statement from one of our papers. You, collaborators in Hungary, well, they killed, they killed a beagle. Uh, and I, 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 because, you know, seven or eight years ago I didn't worry about these things. But you know, I, now I, I struggle with these issues a bit. I'm not trained to worry about those things, but now I struggle a bit. So Frame is, is an organisation, I don't know if there's an equivalent in Australia, perhaps there is, and perhaps it's international, I don't know, but anyway, it's based in London, that much I know, and they run workshops. And their aim is the elimination 
of use of laboratory, laboratory animals in medical and scientific procedures. And they run workshops and they offer grants as to how modelling can address those aims. Here's a statement from the web page in 2012. Frame is disappointed that the annual Home Office statistics on use of animals in scientific experiments show that the total number of procedures has risen again. So in spite of all that work that Frame and others are uh, uh, applying in this space, uh, more and more animals are being sacrificed in the, for whatever reasons. And I, I struggle because they were, they were sacrificed because associated with the work that we did. Why does this happen? Partly because there's not enough reuse of data. That's one reason. The good thing is that there are repositories for models which have all been validated against experimental data. There's something called Salamel, it's, it's come out of Auckland University, where a model doesn't appear in that repository until it has been fully validated against all the data in the paper where it was introduced and in subsequent papers as well. So it's a, rep it's a repository that you know that if you take a model from there, it's going to work in the way that it should. But this issue of reuse of data is a, is a huge problem. In drug development, I visited, um, when I visited uh, Kent, Sandwich in Kent, a few years ago, before Pfizer closed down, and we saw their, their beagle unit. The beagles are all inside. Um, they all look perf perfectly healthy. They told me that only one or two died a year. Um, they were never allowed outside, so they spent all their life inside. So they weren't allowed outside because they wanted dogs in a controlled environment. But perfectly healthy environment, just when they were outside. Um, but efforts are now underway to try and replace some of these industry and regulator approaches to use models. And previously, that's not that's not really happened. So these are these are new developments. A year after I went to Pfizer, that, that shut with the loss of two. 2,400 jobs. So what's actually happening now is more outsourcing. So Oxford is actually doing some work uh, for the pharmaceutical companies. And finally, <coughs> the, the future, as I said, if I'm, because I'm in a future environment institute, what my future is um, perhaps we can do something, perhaps modelling can do something to mitigate this. Um, and also, to be used more and more in a clinical environment. And why is that picture there? Anyone guess why that picture's there? There's a bit of juice. So the French stopped their nuclear testing in the Pacific in 1996. It was not because the French suddenly were concerned about the inhabitants of the Pacific and, and indeed New Zealand, and we used to live in New Zealand. It was for another reason. What was the reason? Sorry? Exactly. So they collected the data and built the models. They were pretty happy that the models would do the sorts of things that they should do. And so that's what I hope for a future environment in this space. Uh, so one more slide. You can't really see this very well, but acknowledgements to... Um, so colleagues uh, in, at QUT, Ian Turner, Pamela Barrage, Tim Maroney, Chen Chen Young, Nicole Kusamano, uh, colleague at UQ I've worked with over the years, Dave Abramson, and colleagues at Oxford, Banker Rodriguez, Anna Maria Carusi, uh, Kira Dangerfield, Vicente Grau, Nick Hale, David Kay, Alfonso Bonarrovio, John Wormsley, and Esther Peo in Saragossa. And the final thing I wanted to say was that I reckon this works well in the sense that this, this collaboration between QUT and Oxford has been has been going on for a number of years. Um, the role in QUT, well, one would say, would be more computational than, than anything else, but the, you know, the computational developments that, that people in the maths department have made in the space are, are quite significant. Uh, and the other thing I want to, oops, sorry, the other thing I want to say is this is the, mo this is the most amazing, uh, the most environment. It's the Institute for Future Environments. It is 
an institute for future environment. So it is itself. It, is, it represents what it is. And there's nothing like this in Oxford, and there's very few places like this anywhere in the world. So we're very privileged to be in, in such a place. Thank you, Ranch.